chemical bonding, organic. So this is um, chapter six and chapter seven in your modern chemistry textbook. And then I'm just going to focus on the organic molecules, which are the molecular or covalently bonded molecules, um, which is non-metal, non-metal bonding. Um, okay, so, so we know that there's multiple forms of bonding. We've already learned about ionic bonding, which is the metal, non-metals that um, transfer electrons. You can see that in this example here where the magnesium is giving an electron to one chlorine and giving its other electron to a different chlorine um, to get a magnesium with a positive two charge and then two chlorines each with a negative one charge. Ionic bonding between a metal and a non-metal. We also have covalent bonding, which is where they share. So that's what you see down here with the two chlorines. Notice there are no charges written. We have a positive two and the two negatives on the chlorines and ionic, but in a covalently bonded compound, we do not have the positive and negative. Now, as you'll learn in the chapter that, um, actually we did learn it last chapter, the levels of polarity, where um, depending on the electronegativity difference between the two atoms, uh, you can get basically different levels of ionic character. So partial charges exist when these electrons move, sort of orbit around the nucleus of the atom. Depending on the electronegativity, it might share, it might stay on one atom more time than on the other. Chlorine and chlorine are the same, so they're gonna share equally. So this is gonna be a non-polar covalent where we don't actually have anything except very, very temporary charges. Um, so London dispersion forces, but covalent bonds can form um, dipole-dipole, which is where we have like a strong partial and a strong negative charge. We would call that polar covalent. And then magnesium with the chlorine, these ion bonds, um, we call that ion-ion bonding. So we're gonna go through that a little bit as we um, go through these slides. So here's just a nice visual representation of ionic and covalent bonding where uh, we have ionic bonding tightly packed together, um, positives and negatives from neighboring atoms uh, all closely packed because the positive from one molecule might attract a negative from another molecule, right? So we get that really strong crystalline structure covalent bonding with the sharing of electrons, and we don't have those full negative and positive charges. A lot of our covalently bonded molecules um, tend to be gases, just because they tend to have uh, weaker intermolecular forces because they don't have the ion-ion um, moment. They have either dipole-dipole or they have the London dispersion forces. Here's the ionic character I was talking about. You guys did see this last chapter, so just to review, um, again, when you subtract the electronegativity difference, if it's below 0.3, we consider that non-polar covalent, and that's pretty much equal sharing of electrons. Polar covalent is unequal sharing, so again, still sharing, but unequal sharing because one of the elements is significantly more electronegative than the other. And then we have ionic character, which is non-metal and metal bonding where electrons are actually transferred. Um, so we get a very high difference in electronegativities. So here's a nice visual representation again of those three. Here we have the non-polar covalent bond. So we have equal sharing. Um, notice there are no partial charges. This says 0.4. Honestly, if you Google it, if you look in your books, you're going to see 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So it is sort of a general one. In this class, we're going to use 0 0.3. And so anything lower, we'll consider nonpolar covalent. And anything higher, we will consider polar covalent, which is where we get these partial charges. This little symbol here means partial. It does mean that electrons are still sharing. Notice you can see here that they're still being shared, but electrons are going to spend more time over here, hence the negative. Electrons are negative, so more time over here, and then quickly around the positive side. So the more electronegative side will have the partial negative charge, um, making it a polar covalent bond. And then again, the ionic bond where electrons are actually transferred. There is no sharing of electrons. When the electron is transferred, it gets a positive and negative charge, which tightly holds the atoms together. Um, but again, they're not actually sharing electrons. Uh, 
a little definition for covalent bonding, electron sharing um, is how we can identify a covalent bond when electrons are being shared. So you see that here where we have a hydrogen and a chlorine. The hydrogen um, pairs with the chlorine using, using these unpaired electrons. We call these bonding electrons. These electrons here, hydrogen doesn't have it, right? Hydrogen has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven because it's in group 17. It has seven valence electrons. So one of those valence electrons is a bonding electron, but the other six are paired off in lone pairs. Typically, we don't make bonds with lone pairs. Later in this unit, we will get into ex an expanded octet. So you'll see sort of how we make bonds with lone pairs, but um, that's, that's not really where we're headed right now. For now, lone pairs don't bond, bonding electrons do. So we use Lewis dot structures to show the difference between bonding electrons and lone pairs. And the reason that uh, covalently bonded molecules share electrons is because they each want to have eight electrons. Those shared electrons count for both molecules, and then they each want to have um, eight total electrons. Um, we call that the octet rule. And uh, the bonding electrons basically count for both molecules because those are the ones being shared. So that's sort of our goal. Here you can see um, two ways to write Lewis structures and they both complete the octet rule. So I'm gonna focus on the fluorine since that's how we have it both times. So fluorine typically has seven valence electrons in group 17, just like chlorine did in the other example. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then this electron came from this fluorine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then again, they share these uh, bonded electrons. So if I were to count for octet rule, I would say two, four, six, and then these bonded ones go to both. So eight on this fluorine, and then on this fluorine, I have two, four, six, and then eight again. So it completes the octet rule. You can do Lewis structures like this where you sort of circle the um, ones that are shared. You can show them overlapping. We typically do it like this, I think, just because it's a little cleaner and a little faster. Um, so this is where we share or we show a line to show two electrons. Every line represents two electrons. So this fluorine has two, four, six, eight, because again, the line represents these two electrons. And then this fluorine has two, four, six, eight. If I were to go over and do that on oxygen here, this oxygen has two, four, and then six, eight. Um, again, those two bonds in the middle, each bond is two electrons. So when you have a double bond, that's four electrons. So this oxygen here has two, four, six, eight. Again, it has two sets of lone pairs and then the bonds, the double bond has four electron sharing. So the same thing if I move on to nitrogen, nitrogen has the lone pair, which is two, and then I have a triple bond here. So that's six electrons being shared. So I have six in the middle and then the, extra, the other two to make the full octet is over here. And then same thing with our other nitrogen, six being shared and then our lone pair makes eight. Um, hydrogen is the only one that won't do that. That's because it only bonds on the first energy level, which is its valence energy level and only two electrons can go on there. So hydrogen is full at two. Um, everyone else is full at eight. Hydrogen, uh, we, uh, we just saw a molecule, actually we just saw a bunch of molecules, oops, wrong direction. We just saw a bunch of molecules that were all bonded to themselves. Um, these are called diatomic molecules. Um, it just means that when they're alone in their elemental form, they need to appear in twos in order to be stable. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Um, I use the acronym Huckleberry Phenol. So Huck, the, that's the H, and then Cole is the CL, and then Berry is the BR, and then E is the I, so Huckleberry, and then Phi, uh, uh, sorry, Berry is BR, Phi, the like Pheno, that's F, and then I, and then N, and then O, Pheno. 
Um, so I don't know if you're good with acronyms. If not, know that there are seven diatomic molecules. And when you circle them on the periodic table, which is what you see in this picture, they actually make the letter seven. Um, so if you can remember that, you know, it's this let it's this number seven, I just called it a letter. It's this number seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the seventh one is hydrogen over here. So diatomics, they appear in twos. They need to bond to each other to be stable. And that's what you saw on the last slide there. Um, these are all of our nonpolar covalent molecules. There are a few more that have very close electronegativities, but these ones definitely are um, because they have the exact same electronegativity because it's the same atom. All right, bond length is the distance between the nuclei of the atoms. Um, so that also is related to size, right? If you have a very small atom, the bond length is gonna be significantly shorter. If you have a large atom, it's gonna be significantly bigger and so forth. Um, energy is the, or bond energy is the energy required to break that bond. So you can see in the table, um, when we're, it, we've specifically focused on some of the diatomics there, hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, um, you can compare their bond lengths and bond strengths. Typically, as we get bigger, you can kind of see it increase right up to chlorine. And then with bromine, it actually jumped back down and iodine as well. Like it kind of peaks at chlorine. Um, and then uh, the reason is, is because, so you can see hydrogen is super high. It's the smallest. It only has an S orbital, right? Uh, hydrogen only has one energy level and uh, that's in the S orbital. It doesn't actually have the P or the D or the F. So um, its bond energy is extremely high. It's a really tightly packed molecule. It's, the bond length is very short. It's extremely high. So then fluorine, um, we go to fluorine, it's a bigger molecule, so we get a little farther apart. It also contains a P orbital, which means that there's more electrons in there. Um, because of that, uh, it makes the effective nuclear charge a little weaker, which makes the bond energy um, less. We need less uh, energy required to break that bond. Uh, chlorine then, it jumps, it jumps back up because again, we still have the same amount of orbitals that fluorine has. So that's just the general trend of um, the effective nuclear charge. Then we get to bromine and now all of a sudden we have a D orbital. So you can see that the energy required then again, shot back down. Um, and then same thing with iodine, it's the same as bromine, um, again, with a D orbital. If you were to continue to go down, you would see it drop again um, because we would add an F orbital and so forth. So adding those other uh, orbitals and energy levels uh, weakens the effective nuclear charge. Therefore, we require less bond energy to break the bonds. Uh, so when we uh, have our covalently bonded molecules and they're making different structures, um, we, we, we know that in general, um, a lot of covalently bonded compounds tend to be gas, um, but sort of as they get bigger, they can turn into like liquids and solids. Um, here are three ways that a network solid, so that's what we call a covalently bonded molecule that's making a solid. We call it a network solid. This is different than a lattice um, structure, that crystalline structure that's formed by ionic bonds where you have the tightly packed negative and positives. Network solids can actually be formed three ways. So you see in the first picture, the graphite picture, that it, it's kind of um, like slabs that are on top of each other. Um, you can see in the diamond, which is the strongest, you can kind of see in the middle. So there's this like outside structure, but then they're all connected sort of in the middle too. That's what makes it so strong. And then this buckyball structure where it's almost like taking one of those sheets and wrapping it around. So it's actually kind of like hollow in the middle. Um, if you could imagine that, I mean, obviously there's like electron clouds. It's not really empty space, um, but uh, there is more space sort of in the middle than here. So that would make it the... Um, that would make the diamond the strongest. That's why diamonds are so strong, is because of their structures. But there's three ways here um, that a network solid can form. These are the general three ways. Carbon is a great example because we see all three of these types of carbons regularly. 
So this is just, you guys saw this on the um, chemical bonding ionic notes. So here it is again. Um, so this is the complete uh, picture. We have a structure. We either have ionic bonding, which is metal, non-metal. So an example would be sodium chloride. We have covalent. If it is covalent, we need to know if it is like a, like a network solid or if it's a molecular compound, which again, tends to be like gases. And then, um, or like our third structure can be the metallic, which is, um, the example here is copper, which is what like wires are made out of. So sort of malleable, but it's just a bunch of metal atoms tightly packed together with a sea of electrons. So ionic and metallic we've covered, now we've covered covalent. So here's your complete sort of summary of the three general types of bonds that we can have.